Hello, everybody. Things go wrong with technology and me. So thank you very much for uh, attending today. Uh, I can now see in the box that you were also telling me that I was on mute. So thank you so much. Uh, keep the chat coming and I will... Um, I will read it next time. Uh, my name is Lucy Siegel and I'm hosting today's very special session from Healthy Seas. This is the first in a series of webinars. And um, this one is very exciting because we're talking about how we can be better ocean allies. Um, so how can marine species and humans form the ultimate buddy system? And um, you'll notice there's a reference to diving in the very title. Um, Healthy Seas, I'm sure you know all about Healthy Seas, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Healthy Seas was founded in 2013 to tackle the ghost fishing phenomenon, um, which is responsible for the needless death of ocean wildlife. At this point, Healthy Seas has 170 volunteer divers and is involved in programs all around the world, which we'll hear about in a minute. Um, uh, works with 620 fishermen and fish farms because it's a collaborative process, which I'm sure we'll talk about as well, and has collected 510 tons of waste fishing nets, which is just awesome, frankly. Um, and you know what happens to the fishing nets, or maybe you don't, so I'll just explain that. So um, the fishing nets are going to a regeneration system. Uh, through a process called Econeal, uh, which is run by Aquafil, and um, it's regenerated into nylon, which is used uh, primarily in the fashion industry. And you may have seen lots and lots of coverage of um, apparel, particularly sports apparel, in the fashion press, in media all over the world, which is made from ghost fishing nets. So not only is it a brilliant thing to rescue wildlife and um, get rid of pollution, but it's also got a lot of traction um, in the fashion industry, which is kind of very important. Um, I'd like to say massive thank you to um, Jenny Iani from Healthy Seas, who you may see in a little box here. Could you give us a wave? She, she doesn't she doesn't like to speak she likes to be behind the scenes um so jenny has really really pioneered these webinars through covid 19 because um it's really, really important that we have this conversation, perhaps now more than ever. Um, and really, what we've been focusing on is just raising awareness about that inextricable link between humans and the ocean. And this sort of feeds into the UN Ocean Dialogues and all the work that's been done around 2020 being the year that we really, really talk about blue recovery and we talk about ocean health and human health. So thank you very much to Jenny. Um, we basically need to step up, that's what we're saying, as ocean advocates um, and emphasise that connection. So I'm really, really pleased that we have two amazing speakers today who I'll introduce now um, uh, because they are unbelievable ocean advocates. So Pascal Van Erp, could you wave so we see Hello. or speak as well? Uh, loads of you will know Pascal, I'm sure. He is a GUE trained technical diver. He has always enjoyed wreck diving most. He got into this because he did hundreds of dives all around the world and he kept noticing um, uh, lost and abandoned, abandoned fishing gear. He then... Um, by his own admission, became preoccupied with the removal of lost gear in the North Sea, co-founded a Dutch North Sea cleanup project, um, and then went on to devote all of his diving time to uh, Ghost Diving Foundation, which was formerly Ghost Fishing Foundation. Um, to date, um, he and his volunteers have run fishing gear surveys and removal projects all over the world, the North Sea, the Adriatic Sea, the Aegean Sea, where I met them first, the Mediterranean, the Caspian, the Baltic, the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and also um, Scapa Flow uh, in the Orkneys. So welcome, Pascal. We'll hear from you in a minute. And also welcome to Tom Mustill. Wave. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Tom, for being here. Tom is a, um, a biologist by training and a wild, wildlife and science filmmaker. Um, he's had a number of hits, um, and uh, one of those was Nature Now, which he filmed with Greta Thunberg and George Monbiot, and is a short. It's a, a, a film that went viral, and it's about natural solutions to climate change. It is unbelievably effective in clear communication and basically won two Webbies recently. So he's also a highly decorated uh, filmmaker. We're very lucky to have him with us today. Um, he became obsessed with whales 
when a humpback whale breached um, and landed landed on him. He was in a kayak in Monterey Bay uh, whale watching. Um, it's, uh, I don't want to be flippant about it because it was a near-death encounter, but it caused Tom um, to go back and make a film three years later called Humpback Whale, a detective story, um, and ask the question, was this whale deliberately trying to hurt him? Jenny, shall we have a look at the trailer? If this works, we should see the trailer. We'd like it with sound. I think, Tom, if you unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. There we go. OK. Yes. Did you see the trailer? I don't know. I, I, I'm new to this platform. Sorry, I, I, excuse me, my technical ignorance. I'm, did, did, did the people watching, could they see the trailer? Can someone just pop a note and say whether they saw it? It was, it was too, too small. small. OK. <laughs> We're going to try okay. again. We're going to try again. It might be easier to play it Here off the go. BBC's website. Let me give it one. Maybe Pascal could reenact it because he's large in my screen. Share the screen, says Helen Banks. I tell you what, don't worry about it. I could, uh, I can tell you about it if you'd like. Yeah, tell us. <laughs> okay, so. Um, I mean, uh, I was kayaking in Monterey Bay and a uh, humpback whale breached on top of me and my friend, um, it uh, was about eight in the morning and it fully breached out of the sea and landed on top of both of us in our kayak and dragged us underwater. Oh, we could give you the YouTube link as well. I'll show you the link as soon as I stop saying this. Um, and it was extraordinary and terrifying and we were very lucky not to be injured at all or killed um, and, uh, we didn't realize that somebody had filmed it on their phone from a boat nearby uh, and a few days later after nobody had believed us for ages that this had happened um, uh, somebody put it on youtube and then it went viral um, let me let me just find the link you guys just hang on a sec it might just be easier to give you the youtube link of it um, okay so while while we give you the link um it is such an amazing documentary if anyone's seen it just put, put a note in the chat box um it is so basically when i got Tom it goes I, back, oh, you got i got it, it. oh Stephen Mitchley, you got there ahead of me but i'm going to put it in the <laughs> side here now what's the best way to do this should lucy do you want to click it and then share screen or do people want to just watch it on the side of this because it feels like there's a lag, so whoever, whichever one of us puts it. Oh, Shreya says share screen. Let's go for it. Who does that? Can you do it, or do I have to do it? Well, I've got all my work windows up on my screen, so it'd be really embarrassing. You'll see my shopping list and stuff like <laughs> that. So I'd rather you do it. <laughs> okay, I'll try and do it. Does that work? Yeah, there's some advert on it. Oh, I think you're gonna have to make yours still too small. We're gonna have to make that window fully big somehow. Is that working? There you go. That's working for me. It's got no sound. Well, I reckon that's probably the least dramatic representation of it that I've seen for a while. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, Could you not see that? It didn't, it basically is lagging. I think if we play it through our computers, there's such a lag on the uh, seminar system that it doesn't really go through properly. So guys, if you just check, click in the um, uh, link on the side there, I'll put it up again. Uh, it'll probably work better on your own computers at home, um, seeing as the ones aren't working very well for us. Um, okay, it, so so while we, while we watch that, we got the general impression. What is it like for you when you watch it? Uh, well, I've watched it so many times now that I just I just stare at different bits of it. I don't know if, if it's the same with you, but you when you watch something a lot, you look at you 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 get so used to it, and even though it's such an extraordinary and strange and powerful thing, um, it feels kind of 
separate to me. Well, I, I don't remember it. It didn't look like that to me. It looked like a giant whale coming above me and landing on top of me. Uh, whereas these people saw it from the distance. Um, the process because you went and you discovered you tried to find that whale well yeah so i'm i, I was in monterey bay visiting some scientists who work at the Mar marine biological uh, aquarium research institute or umbari which is on monterey bay which is probably one of the best places in the world for marine biodiversity really close to shore there's a huge undersea canyon and there's lots of scientists who are based there who send uh, rovs and other scientific equipment out there and there's loads of whale watchers who go out and that year uh, when I was visiting these underwater robot makers, we looked out the window and we could see all these humpback whales in the bay just offshore. And they said, oh, you should go check them out. Uh, and the best way to do that is to go with a kayak tour. So the next morning, uh, I went with a kayak tour with my friend Charlotte, and she's an accountant and she'd never seen a, a humpback whale before. Or in fact, she'd never seen a marine mammal apart from a seal. She'd never seen a cetacean before. Um, and we saw loads of humpbacks and they were feeding they've been feeding on a huge aggregation of small fish that had been massing in the canyon mouth um and then we started and turned around and went back to shore uh and i don't know if you guys have been well watching but you can you know if it's still you can smell their fishy breath on the air and you uh how did i record it i didn't record it it was recorded by a tourist i was on the kayak <laughs> that was far away from them but very close to me um, I actually had two GoPros with me, but as a wildlife filmmaker, I hate having to film when I'm not working because I like just experiencing things. So I said, let's leave the GoPros at, at home. Everybody has the same whale watching video. Ours won't be any different. So that is a bit embarrassing because probably I'd have had one of the most extraordinary like, perspectives on a whale that anyone's ever had. But I had that with my eyes and we were heading back to shore and then the whale just erupted out the sea, landed on top of us dragged us underwater, smashed the front of the kayak up. We were thrown out of it. I thought she was dead. I thought I was dying. I thought I'd broken all my limbs and was in shock and swam back up to the surface. She was safe and fine. So was I. We crawled back into our broken kayak. It, somebody tied it to another kayak and we went back to shore. And then she flew back to the UK. She fainted on the flight, uh, had to be given oxygen. Um, I went camping with some friends. No one believed either of us. And then this viral video came out and um, I'm a wildlife documentary maker, I'm a conservationist by background, and um, I was mainly a bit embarrassed at first because I felt people would think that I was harassing the whales and lots of the comments on the story was you shouldn't be there or you got too close. Um, I used to work on a whale watching boat making sure people didn't get too close, so that was particularly annoying for me because we've been being really careful. Um, but it's quite hard to avoid a whale when it comes out of the sea from underneath you. Um, anyway, uh, life went on. And I just got really interested in that community of people in Monterey Bay. Uh, anytime anything to do with whales came up in the news, um, I, I looked into it and I realized that there was this really complex story taking place where whales were being killed in vast numbers by being entangled in uh, fishing gear, crab fishing gear mainly, being hit by boats, which is called ship strike. Um, and because of other threats to them, like uh, oceanic noise and the loss of their food. And the network of people who were trying to help the whales wasn't just scientists, it was also citizens. Um, people volunteering to go and take the nets off them when they get caught. So, uh, citizen scientists trying to track them so we could find out as much about the whales as possible. People going to the law courts um, and people putting, scientists putting cameras on the whales back, putting microphones called hydrophones on the sea floor. And I thought there's this amazing story of all these different ocean users and a really scary story about how whales are in trouble. So I thought I could use the really crazy thing that happened to me uh, and all the interest that it generated as a way into that story of that ocean community and all these different people uh, trying to help whales and find out about them. So although we said, like, was it trying to hurt me? I never thought it was trying to hurt me. That was the question that everybody asked me. But I thought if I pose that at the beginning of a film, maybe people would watch the film and I could lead them to more interesting questions like what's happening to whales and who's doing something about it. It's quite hard to get 
your head round. <laughs> and it's I, I really urge you to go and watch the documentary. Find find out where you can watch the documentary. But one of the things, one of the people, you talk about this network of people who are all there to uh, try and safeguard whales and try and protect them. One of the things the one of the participants says something to the effect, it's not up to the whale to get tangled in ropes or lines or nets. And you know, it's 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 our responsibility. So I wanted to talk to Pascal. I want to bring you in here. What do you make of what happened to Tom? Um, have you ever seen anything like that? And from your vantage point, what is your connection with the wildlife? Because presumably, often you are cutting wildlife free from nets. That's that's correct. Um, well, unfortunately, the connection with wildlife we have is that we see them entangled in lost fishing gear very often underwater while diving. And um, so that's not really good. The, the times that I really can enjoy life, uh, underwater life, wildlife, uh, marine species, is after the releasement. Just um, a little bit about the process and how, how you work and some of the things that you've seen. I think we might have some slides if that's not a complete disaster, trying to share our screen again. But <laughs> tell us a little bit about how you approach your work and what, and how, and what you do. And does it, does it depend on, presumably it depends what sea you're in, the conditions are very variable, and things like cooperation with um, the fishing community. Sometimes you have cooperation, sometimes you don't, I'm guessing. Um, yeah. Um, well, it's 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 very complicated. Normally, we all dive for leisure. We like to uh, like to look at wrecks. We like to look at uh, at, at reefs. Um, but what we do is um, we are solving a problem. Lost fishing gear is is down there. It's everywhere in every sea. There is where there is fisheries. There is lost fishing gear. And um, we, with our diving teams uh, globally are trying to, uh, to, to to get that fishing gear out and to release animals. And the main purpose of our organizations, and actually Health Seas the Ghost Diving, where we work for, is to uh, expose the problem. It's, we, 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 don't, we don't think that we can solve it, not even when we work forever, because the, the, the issue is really big. But what we can do is teach the people uh, teach the world uh, about what is really going on down there. And then when you, when you see a flat sea, you see a sunrise, it's all nice, but what is down there is really horrible. And um, I think we are we are the ones who have to, say, have to tell this story. More people are becoming more interested. And what is the key? What is the thing that we need to do well, to stop? Um, the abuse because it's an I, abuse i think the message is, is is more or less landing now when we, when we started uh, our foundation in 2012 we were only running for three years uh on ghost net removal in the north sea uh, we did some research ourselves and only the 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 noah was talking about it in some reports but it was not really for the main public at that moment so uh what we did was setting up a website uh, mobilizing teams and showing pictures from what we saw uh, during the last three years and I must say, if I now look back, if I now type in the word ghost fishing, then I see really a lot of information about the topic. Uh, organizations who are trying to do something about it, funding's coming, governments who are working on it, even fisheries are working on it. But back in those days, in 2012, we had no hits. So that is telling me that there is really something happening at this moment. So I think we already made it happen what we wanted feel like that um, people's perception is changing? Do you think that people are understanding that they are more linked to the ocean than they thought? Well, I think it's important to have a, a, bit of, a bit of context. It's only really been in the last 50 or 60 years that most people have even realized it was possible to affect the ocean. Um, there wasn't really in our culture until the 1950s or 1960s an idea that humans were capable of changing something as big as the sea, uh, of affecting the vast numbers of animals that live there. Um, and really it's been since writers like Rachel Carson and other environmentalists started bringing this up. And then you had things like the Save the Whales movement um, uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, which was one of the first big environmental movements. And that was in response, actually, uh, to people 
deciding that they liked whales a bit more in large part because of uh, the release of whale songs and people identifying. Before then, people didn't really talk about whales. They talked about how many they could harvest and what uses they could use them for. Um, so this idea of like the sea being fragile and us either being able to affect the sea badly or being able to change our mind and try and do something good about it is relatively recent in our culture, but it's very unequally distributed. Um, many people are really unaware of what happens in the oceans. I think one of the guys we interviewed for our film was talking about this issue of, of like ghost nets and entanglement. And he said that because uh, this happens somewhere that people can't see it, they don't do anything about it. But if you drove down the street and you saw an elephant caught in the fence and then you drove five yards further on and then you saw a cat and then you saw a, like uh, an elk and you, they were all slowly dying, people would be furious. But because it happens unseen, far away, uh, it's very hard for people to relate to each other. Yeah, I know she wrote Silent String in 1969, but before that, she also wrote quite a lot about oceans. Um, yes, um, I was just I was just putting a thing up because it's quite easy to find that book. I thought people might yeah. want to go and see it. That's really, Rachel uh, Carson. Rachel Carson, one of my heroes. Um, yeah. She is, everybody remembers her for writing about Silent Spring, which was about pesticides and their insidious effects. But she was amazing at writing about the oceans and a beautiful writer. And there's a brilliant New Yorker piece about her, which features some of her writing, which is a great way in as well. About COVID, um, and we, we've heard a lot about people reconnecting with nature. And, um, you know, we've seen a lot of shared videos on YouTube about animals finding their way back into, um, you know, petrol forecourts or schools or, you know, reclaiming spaces, or at least that's what it looked like. Do you think that there it will be a difference coming out of uh, lockdown and coming out of this global pandemic? Do you think that people have a different relationship with nature that we could usefully employ to safeguard the ocean? Pascal, what do you think? Well, first of all, I truly hope so. Uh, how, however, I think that after COVID, I, I, I think that everything will be back to normal as the normal as people are used to uh, i don't think that is normal because i think we should take a lot more care of our nature as that we did and uh, what i what i really was amazed about that i see um, um, media articles around me that that, that the, the nature is restoring it seems to restore around us the moment we are all calming down ourselves so i really hope that it will stay like that but i'm a bit worried that it's not. Well, um, uh, if you're listening, you might not know this, but Lucy and I present a podcast together called So Hot Right Now, in which we interview various environmentalists and, and journalists and writers about climate and nature. And one of the people that we interviewed was Christiana Figueres, who is the United Nations climate negotiator, uh, who recently, uh, with a guy called Tom Karnak, wrote a book called The Future We Choose, where they tried to describe the two both equally possible worlds that are available to us. One, the world if we don't change and we go back to business as usual, we continue on the trajectory that we are on towards increase, which for the oceans means sea levels rise, fish stocks deplete, plastics increase, and acidification increases, um, which is not the one we want. And another one that we could choose if we use other ways of shipping, other ways of packaging, other ways of making our food, other ways of traveling. Um, and what she said was that we thought we had 10 years to sort this out, uh, the climate crisis and the associated biodiversity crisis. But because of COVID and because of the enormous financial decisions that are being made, we don't have like an unlimited checkbook to write solutions to COVID. So whichever solutions we decide to pay for now, we'll be locked into, we'll empty the bank for the next decade. So we'll set ourselves on a trajectory and different countries are choosing different trajectories. In the United States, unfortunately, it, this trajectory is being chosen where organizations are being given finance to recover from the um, uh, COVID effects to their businesses where they're not required to change, even if they might be large fossil fuel emitters or natural resource extractors. 
That's not the same in, in the EU. There, there's a plan in the EU where, where, where the recovery would be a green recovery and the bailouts given would help to speed the transition to the uh, technologies and the kinds of industries that we need to help to get into a better state for our seas and in general. So it's unclear what how COVID is going to affect us. It can't go back to how it was before because the world has changed, but it, it really is a really mixed bag because different countries and different organizations are spending their money in different ways, putting us all in different pathways, and it's really messy. Talking about climate, which you just introduced there, Tom, Nina says, how can restoring whale populations impact climate change? Is there a direct link in that way? Oh, sorry, I was just flying to, I saw Flora said the, the future we choose. Yes, that's what it's called, the future we choose. It's really good, um, by the way. Um, Pascal, Pascal, do you want to answer this one? Um, I, was, I was reading a message, sorry. Um. <laughs> I'll do it if you want. I, I'm not, uh, oh, oh, the, the, uh, basically. I was going to go to Pascal afterwards, which is why I asked you. Okay, okay. Sorry, Lucy, sorry, There's sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry, I felt I'd been talking for ages, excuse me. Uh, um, uh, um, so uh, the, it's really interesting. Um, what we're realizing more and more that many natural uh, systems, processes and animals ha have a big role to play in the cycling of carbon. And uh, what that means is the, the planet Earth, uh, including the atmosphere, the water, the rock, uh, there's carbon in it. But as uh, with different weathers, different amounts of radiation from the sun and living animals move that carbon around. One thing that whales do is when they take a crap, excuse me, on the surface, uh, this takes uh, carbon and, and it also takes, oh, sorry, it mainly takes, fertilizes the, the, uh, the surface water, which allows algae to grow on the surface water where they normally wouldn't be able to, because normally that fertilizer is in the deep sea where the light can't penetrate. So the whales bring up um, fertilizer to a place where sunlight can meet it, which means plants, like tiny plants like algae, can grow. They grow, they bloom, and then they sink. When whales die, they also sink to the seafloor. And that is net a much bigger draw of carbon down from the surface. And the surface water is where carbon gets up into the atmosphere and taking it down to the seafloor where it can enter the geological cycle and be removed. So gradually, whales pull a huge amount of carbon out of the atmosphere and lock it away. Um, and, uh, and we're realizing that lots of other things that, that we do are really also bad for the carbon cycle, like dredging. Um, tiny, tiny bits of uh, broken seashell and other things like that that contain carbon float in our water and they gradually settle out in the sediment. But when we dredge the bottom of the sea, we churn that up and that actually releases lots of carbon up into the atmosphere. So it doesn't, when you start looking at how much money you get for killing and selling a whale or how much you get for dredging up and selling some scallops if you do it in a bad way, and you don't take into account the enormous cost in carbon uh, and how expensive it will be to try and suck that carbon back, um, you realize that uh, we should be not doing these processes because we need all the help we can get in trying to decarbonize our atmosphere back to uh, levels that would give us a, li a livable planet. I feel comfortable in the conversation. Shonda asks, and I want to come to you, Pascal. I know we're leaping around a little bit here. Um, Shonda says, is there an effort to educate pier and shore fishermen? Um, Tom just mentioned dredging as well, so possibly also trawler trawlermen. Uh, uh, Shonda says she's been reading about turtle entanglements near the shores from people discarding their fishing lines at these points. Um, well, since, since the years we work, let, let's start with the beginning. The beginning we were uh, working on this topic, we had the idea that the fishermen really didn't care. But we already learned quite fast that they do care, and um, the losing of nets is absolutely not on purpose. Of course, there are always uh, cases that a net is discarded or dumped. Of course, you know, we all know that. But that's not the majority of the cases. Um, a fisherman is fishing to earn money. He's just doing his job. Um, 
the reason that he is losing his nets is because of objects on the water, uh, because he is snagging a reef, which he, which is actually objects and and stones on the water, rocks, uh, reefs. They are they are changing through time. Uh, for example, a wreck. If you have a shipwreck, it can fall apart. So the parts they were not there the year before. They are not there now. So when he's coming too close and he thinks that he is at the same position as the last time, this time he can lose his net. And um, when a fisherman is losing his net. Uh, the next fisherman can lose his net or his line into that net which is already lost. So it's actually a circle. So um, I'm absolutely convinced that the fisheries are absolutely aware of what they are doing. And um, it is confirmed by, the, by, the, by, the, by all the years we are now working together with them. And I'm, I'm really happy with that because in the beginning I had a really bad feeling about this. Um. Retrieval in in the Aegean, um, off the coast of Sicily. Yeah. When I came along for one of those days, and I was really surprised to see fishermen working with you. And then they told me that they've been trying to get that net out of the water for ten years. Yes, exactly. They've been left by a fish farm after a storm. Is it true that fish s sort of get wise or learn where these? these ghost nets are, and then they, according to the fishermen, they start to avoid the area, so there's no catch at all. Well... I, Is that I, folklore from Sicily? I try to believe that, but I'm not sure about that, because we see, we see a lot of entanglements, so I don't think that, that, that underwater... You, you ask me that, if you tell me that underwater life is avoiding ghost nets, right? No, I don't, I don't think so, sorry. <laughs> No, that's fine. That's, it was then that suggested. How do you um, do like community outreach? Like, how do you speak to uh, the fishing community? Um, the fishing community is our connection point, and then I'm talking about health seas. We are we're working with the Health Seas uh, uh, Foundation uh, to collect uh, end of life fishing nets from fishermen. Okay, so we work with uh, with harbors which uh, have a lot of ships uh, involved. And they, th these guys are just giving us the fishing nets they don't use anymore. They can deliver them for free, and we take them in to regenerate and upcycle. And this way, we started to build up uh, a very good relationship with them. And uh, well, in some cases, we already have, are very good friends with, with, with some of the fishermen in the Netherlands, for example, something I couldn't imagine in the beginning when we started with this, because they all looked at us at the, the big green monster who's going to tell them that they have to stop fishing. Which is absolutely not the case because, okay, fishing the fishing industry is there. It's a it's a big part of the world. People need to eat. Okay, we understand that there's a there's a, a economic aspect behind, but we have to do it more smart. And I think we are getting there. So the relationship with the fisheries is just something that has to evolve, and it's 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 there now. I've had a couple of questions about single use masks and gloves, so PPE. <laughs> Um, an, an extra source of pollution. Is this something that you're worried about? Have you seen any since you've started diving again, Pascal? There's a question here. Did I see a black screen at my? Is, it, is that what you see too? Oh, yeah, I got you. Say that again, Tom. Oh, I can't see Pascal anymore. I oh, I can them. see him fine. How strange. How oh. weird. Um, you may have to just listen to Pascal's voice, <laughs> lovely voice for a minute if you can't see. Okay, well, uh, I see I see. some people can see me and some people cannot. So <laughs> It's like a lottery. Oh, my God. Well, actually, at least they can hear me then, right? Yes. We can ah, hear you. Well, that's a good. So can you, re can you repeat your question? Sorry for that. I was... So a couple of people have mentioned that they're worried about single-use masks and gloves. So PPE after yeah. uh, COVID, um, are you seeing any in the water so far? And is it an extra source of pollution that you're worried about because they're made of plastic? Uh, it is an extra. It's, at this moment, it's really an extra worry. Uh, I don't see them with diving that easily because the areas we are coming is quite far from shore. Uh, but what, what we do see, I live along the coast, so when I have a beach walk, I come, I see them very regularly. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's actually answering one of the questions more up when someone is asking us, listen, um, do you really have confidence in the, in, the, in the people to change, in the world to change? Well, if I see um, masks and these kind of single use plastics just floating around after this, this, this COVID situation, 
that answers the question already. That's not very hopeful, is it? Um, uh, Tom. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, I'm <laughs> well, I don't want you to lie, so I needed to be honest. That's good exactly. to be honest. Um, Tom, if we're moving into, a few people are asking about um, what regulation we need. What do we need to happen for this to start to shift um, away from, is it true that we're kind of on the brink of collapse? And how do we reverse back from that? And how do we start protecting the ocean in a really meaningful way? Who do we need to contact and who needs to be acting? I mean, that's an impossible question to answer. Like, um, <laughs> that's uh, I guess, I mean, you've got to frame what your challenge is. Uh, you know, an individual person or, or group can take on an entire system. Um, I think it's much easier to think of, of an individual thing that you'd like to try and affect. I saw uh, Shreya says on the side, as a student, if I were to try and raise awareness about this, how do I, how do you suggest I go about it? And who should be my target audience? That's really inter important question because really that question is about how do I change something by talking to somebody? And uh, one of the biggest problems is engagement. I think it's really interesting to hearing Pascal talking about uh, fishermen and coastal communities as being key to this kind of stuff working. So often we think that the that all we need to do as environmentalists or journalists is to point out something bad and say who's bad and that that's, that's great. We've raised, raised awareness about a bad thing. That's not, that's not what we need to do. We need to engage with each other. We need to, I think, move away from just trying to point out who's done the bad stuff because often coastal communities are extremely engaged with their oceans. They're just making money from them and the systems that uh, are forcing them to work in certain ways or they don't really have the availability of other options. So uh, I guess basically we need to change from being obsessed with pointing out bad stuff because that paralyzes humans and choose one uh, solution that you know about and think about who needs to know about that solution uh, and try and target them. So Shrey, if I would, wanted to raise awareness I wouldn't try and raise awareness about something bad. I would try and raise awareness of a solution and bring that awareness to the people who would find that solution useful. Because I think that's the most effective way of generating change. It's like um, the UN Ocean Dialogues and the, the kind of mission to get marine protected areas. Is it is it 30 percent of the ocean by 2030? Do you think those are kind of useful metrics or are they a bit meaningless for you know, when you're going about your everyday life. Uh, for, for me, it was this one, Lucy. Well, I think for all of us, you know, if, if, I, if I take all of us as not working for the UN, how um, useful uh, are they? For, like, in, in, if we consider ourselves to be interested and want to be activists. Yeah, I, I think those, I think that having a narrative to fit your own story into is extremely useful. And having something to aim at and feel like you're doing a small part to aim towards, um, it's really good to have 30 by 30. That's why zero carbon is such a powerful tool rather than just saying less. Once you say zero and that that's our aim, you, you ha it means you scrutinize the decisions that people are making more closely. And I think if, you, if the aim is 30 by 30 and that's agreed on by scientists as being a minimum that would be necessary, but also a highly achievable uh, aim, I, I think that's a thing which the more you standardize that use within the people you're talking to, like whether it's your family or within the policymakers or fish, uh, fishing communities, um, then it becomes a thing that people kind of can hang their conversations off. Um, Do you just, um, if people want to, will become divers and you know join join you guys i mean what what is the process for getting involved with what you do um well first of all what we are doing is um it's not easy it's dangerous and um it's a task load so even when you are have a, even when you are a diver you really have to be careful what you are doing you have to expect the unexpected. The moment we jump into the water, and wherever it is, it doesn't matter which sea I am, and I dive many of them, I always expect the worst. It can be so blue and clear on the surface, but when I come down at depth, the visibility can be very bad. And the moment we are start pulling nets, it's getting even worse. So the visibility will be returned down to zero. 
and then our job will be even more dangerous. So what I want to say is that um, diving is one thing, but what we are doing is um, we, we remove lost fishing gear. So the diving has to be your nature. You have to do that without thinking. The, 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 the job you have to focus on is to remove the stuff from the seabed. So if you if you put that in perspective, um, we like without without teams to work with uh, with uh, technical divers. The reason for that is that technical divers are really trained uh, to dive in teams, and that's very important because if you uh, you never dive alone, first of all. But in teams, everything in terms of safety is 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 a lot more clear. Um, um, the skills that we our teams are are just um, yeah, how do you call it are all the same in our team. So. Um, Safety is the most important aspect of, of this uh, of this job. And um, what I like to tell the people is, if you really want to become a volunteer in this in this work, um, first make sure that your skills are right. Um, and be be used to work in teams and just try shallow. Okay, just 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 go down there and just pick stuff. Start start picking up stuff. You don't have to do nothing, but just keep it simple. Please keep it simple because we have seen a lot on the water, and I'm still surprised sometimes. Some so really be careful. If you really are interested to join us, it's possible. We have, uh, I think, there's, there's around 12 uh, teams all over the world. Um, you can you can send us an email. Uh, we have our contact details on the ghostfishing.org website, and uh, we will get in touch. About it. Thank you. Um, anybody listening, please do not try this by yourself. Um, as Pascal says, you need to be um, uh, with him and his team. Um, Pascal, just to finish off with, I'm afraid we're going to have to finish up now. And I know that people have got loads of questions. Um, uh, some of them are design related. And I'll tell you about the next Healthy Seas webinar in a minute because um, they would be great for that. Um, but Pascal, um, could you tell us a little bit about your plans for Healthy Seas? Um, like what happens next? Is Are there more territories that you're going to roll out to um are you growing the mission what's happening uh, we are growing the mission we uh, recently uh, expanded uh, to new zealand which where we already had a, a ghost diving team uh, running operational uh, they are now collaborating with us too so meaning we are expanding there our our efforts and working together to uh, get nets into regeneration um, for this year, we have several projects planned, but of course, due to the COVID restrictions, a lot of them didn't happen till now. But uh, our next one will be end of next week in Greece, and you will soon hear uh, more about that. Okay, thank you. Tom rather brilliantly has given you all his contact details in the chat, so you can ask him any more questions about nature and climate. Um, to end with, um, uh, Tom, uh, could you tell me a little bit about what you um, are up to next? And are, you, are we allowed to ask you about your book, which is hopefully coming out next year? Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, um, so while I was making the documentary about uh, humpback whales and ocean communities, uh, I I uh, got into this very strange uh, conversation with some of the scientists who were talking about how a lot of the work they've been previously doing themselves uh, now was being done uh, with help from uh, technologies like artificial intelligence and pattern recognition, machine learning. And so I became fascinated by the effect of new technologies, the combination of being able to send remote sensors, uh, connecting people using the internet, and the huge databases of marine data that were building up and then the powerful pattern recognizing engines uh, that we've built uh, mainly to use on people and what we're finding the kind of patterns we're finding in nature so i'm writing a book about um how to about the change in biology as we use these technologies to find patterns in nature and specifically in trying to look at the communications between animals and specifically whether we'd be able to understand the communications of whales and dolphins um so yeah that'll be out next year it's been really fascinating um amazing and one of the things that we haven't really got around to discussing today are you know is our relationship with with whales particularly do you have any little nugget that you could um that you could leave us with today what did you find out when you went looking for your whale about our relationship with whales i would think the thing that struck me the most was uh, how much humans get uh from looking at whales um you, you go out on whale watching boats 
and there are people who go out. Um, well, Lucy, sorry, I think your microphone is rustling. Um, uh, I, I think people go out um, set hundreds of times, or maybe over a hundred times a year, um, and the people cry, and people will spend loads of their time and their money just to get the experience of seeing something that big um, look at them. You know, so whales sometimes take interest in human boats and they'll swim over and stick their heads out the water and look at the people. And it seems to be a transformational experience and something that many people just can't get enough of. And uh, one woman on a whale watching boat who worked, a lot of these people became whale watching captains and, wor and worked on the boats because they just want to do it again and again and again. And I feel that, yeah, so that's what I've noticed, I, that there is such intrinsic value to these extraordinary animals and that we get something really special that we can't get from all of our technology and all of our human activities by having them in existence and occasionally having the chance to experience them and see them. Amazing place to leave uh, our webinar today because we started out asking the question uh, how marine species and humans can form the ultimate body system to protect our ocean ecosystem. Of course, we've come nowhere near answering it. We just do not do not have enough time. But I hope that um, uh, hearing from Tom and Pascal, thank you guys, been absolutely amazing, has given you a lot of leads and a lot of motivation to find out more, set up more and do more. Um, Please, if you've enjoyed this webinar, do bear in mind that we have another one on the 17th and we'll give you all the details, uh, all the times and everything. And that one is going to be very much focused on design. How do we design out the waste that's causing us so much uh, so many problems what what does eco design mean what does circularity mean and we'll tell you a little bit more about how we are regenerating some of this pollution waste and how we are trying to put it to good use when i say we obviously not me um but thank you very much for joining us today and thank you again to jenny for setting this up and thank you to the brilliant tom mustill and pascal van Erp. we shall see you on the 17th i hope Thank you very Bye, much. Bye, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye.